smallest giant. So echinodermata means spiny skin. There are many different classes. The ones I'd like to look at today are the Asteroidae, Echinoidae, and the Holorithridae. I'm not going to look at these, the brittle stars or the crinoids today, because you can only do so much. Well, what's interesting about um, the class of asteroid, asteroid A, is that they are pentamerous. So they have radial symmetry, but not only that, but they have five arms to their symmetry. And they have an aboral side and an oral side. The oral side has the mouth, it's right in the center. And the aboral side has the anus in the center. And also an interesting structure called the madreporite that takes in water and sends it through the animal's water vascular system, which operates both in gas exchange and movement. And you don't think of sea stars as being very fast moving, but uh, they're not. <laughs> they're not that fast moving, but they can move and they move with their, um, their ampullae and tube feet. So this shows a sea star here that's above the sand and it moves itself down underneath the sand to hide. And this shows a sea star upside down, but it manages to flip itself by bending one of its arms and grasping with its little tube feet until it's flipped itself right over. So they are capable of movement. The tube feet are, are pretty interesting. So uh, this is the madrepore right here. And it brings water in to a central ring, which branches off into the arms. And it has a nervous system, which also has a central ring and branches off into each arm. So it can control its movement with its nervous system. And in this case, um, it causes these little bulbs here to squeeze. And when the bulb squeezes, it changes the direction of the foot. So the ampulla is squeezed, it changes the direction of the foot, and then it relaxes and it lets go. It's an interesting form of locomotion. There are many different kinds of asteroid A. Some of them are, are enormous, like this thorn star. They're huge. Some of them secrete um, kind of a mucus, a gel, that allows them to slip away from their predators. And some have attached arms, but they're still pentamerous. Some have more than five arms. So their, their pentamerous shape is further divided into more arms. This is a sunflower star. And we used to have sunflower stars here on the coast. Um, and we haven't seen them in the intertidal for a number of years. So what happened a few years ago was a wasting disease. It was called a wasting disease. And it affected sea stars uh, all in the Pacific. And many of them died. So this disease, which I believe was caused by a virus, caused the, the bodies of the animals to just disintegrate. But now they are starting to come back significantly. But I haven't seen any sunflower stars yet. They have a very complex surface. Um, they have spiny skin. But the spines are divided into many different kinds of spines with different functions. So there's pedicellary, pedicellary. They're like little claws almost. Uh, there's a spine that's kind of sharp if you touch them. And there's papillae. This is a, a close-up of the madreporite here that brings in water. And they even have some eye spots so they can detect light. So closer up, these are the three-jawed pedicellarae. I think it should work on, no, I don't get animation here, but these are three jaws and they open and close. They open and close and they, they prevent parasites from landing on the sea star, which is uh, often sessile when it's not moving around. 
Respiration occurs through the tube feet, so that's a close-up of a tube foot, but also through peristomial gills. So those are skin gills. So I think that surface features of the sea star are the most, the, one of the most interesting things about them. And they, oh, sorry, they eat by extruding their stomach. So this is a shell. They pry it open with their two feet. They extrude their stomach inside. The enzymes digest the inside of the cell, and then they suck that back into their body. The holorophidae, the sea cucumbers, are also of radial symmetry, but you have to look at them on end to notice, to see that. There are two kinds of feeding mechanisms, deposit feeders, which means they just feed off the bottom, they basically suck food from the bottom, and suspension feeders, which are a gill, kind of like gills, feathery kinds of um, protuberances that filter food out of the water. You'll, you'll notice, you've noticed so far, I'm sure, that a lot of animals that live in water are filter feeders. They filter food out of the water. Even the largest animals that there are, the blue whale, largest animal to ever live, <laughs> ever, is a filter feeder. But the uh, holothuroidae have soft bodies. So they don't have uh, the endoskeleton of the sea star. And they don't have spines, but they can, they're mutable. It's called mutable. So they can get into very, very small spaces because their body has no hard parts, really. So this is somebody holding one and it's just kind of dropping down and elongating itself. Well, um, it can do that to get into small spaces. So it can do that to find food or to hide from predators. There's an interesting story. Uh, regarding sea urchins. So sea urchins are similar to the sea stars in that they have radial symmetry and they have a very spiny skin, uh, but their spines are much, much longer than they are in the sea stars. Uh, but they also use them to move. The otter, that's a sea otter, has no problem eating the sea urchins. They love sea urchins. They tear them apart and they eat the flesh. Well, sea urchins eat um, kelp and other seaweeds. So what's happened on the coast of British Columbia, actually the whole Pacific really, is that otters have been harvested for their fur. And so there weren't predators of the sea urchins for quite a long time. And when there aren't any predators of the sea urchins, the sea urchins tend to multiply like crazy and they eat all the algae. So they create these um, areas known as urchin barrens. So places where there isn't a lot of algae. But when otters are reintroduced, uh, there's a recovery of algae and algae diversity. So um, I personally, I love to go down to Monterey, California because there are sea otter populations down there. There are also sea otter populations on the north end of Vancouver Island. Uh, but in Monterey, they're, they're really easy to see. You can just go on a kayak and, and um, float around and, and see them very, very easily. There's one really large, uh, crazy sea star called uh, Crown of Thorns sea star. And as you can see, it's like got these super tough spines. And this one has... Now, I don't know how long ago this was. It, was. it was starting to happen about 15 years ago, so it might be through the cycle, but they tend to go through a cycle where they, they bloom in numbers, and then they go eat in coral. So they were, they were in great numbers on the coral reef off of Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, and so they were trying to get rid of them so they, they didn't destroy the reef. But it's difficult because, of course, when you if you try to cut them up into little pieces, well, as long as there's the central nerve net left, uh, the animal will just simply grow more parts. It's called fragmentation, growing a, a completely new individual even from a part of itself. So it's very difficult to destroy them. They had this crazy plan that people could fish them, take them out of the sea and bury them on land or something. So that had limited 
success, but I think they just um, basically went through their cycle. So that's all I wanted to say about sea stars, and that was the last aquatic invertebrate that we're going to talk about. So I'll, I'll stop the video now. Thank you for watching.